It is an immense pleasure and privilege to welcome Sudhamurti, author, engineer, social worker, philanthropist, and the chairperson of Infosys Foundation at the University of California at Berkeley and to the Institute for South Asian Studies to deliver before the Sarah Kailat Memorial Lecture on Women and Leadership. And Lawrence Cohn, the director of the Institute. Thank you all for coming, from coming from all over the Bay Area. I just heard it was at least an hour and 45 minutes to get here from the South Bay, so you're all quite heroic. Um, the, um, let me begin. The lectureship is awarded each year to a distinguished figure in government, law, science, philanthropy, business, or the arts, whose career has exemplified that critical quality of leadership. It is named for the late Sarah Kailat, a well-known educator and philanthropist in California, whose commitment to advancing the role of women and girls as leaders in public life took her from the village in South India where she was born and raised and into the heady life of Silicon Valley. There are few persons in the world, I think, who can honor the career and the commitments of Sarah Kailat in as complete and as extraordinary a manner as our justly famed lecturer this evening. Thomas Kailat is an electrical engineer, information theorist, control engineer, entrepreneur, and the Hitachi American Professor of Engineering Emeritus at Stanford University. He is highly decorated. The Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers presented him with its highest award, the Medal of Honor, in 2007 for his exceptional development, and I quote, of powerful algorithms in the field of communications, commuting control, and signal processing. He received the Padma Bhushan in 2009, the National Medal of Science, among the highest honors a scientist can receive in 2014. I would like to open tonight's events by inviting him to address us. I wanted to welcome uh, all of you again, especially Ms. Murthy, but we'll say more about that in a minute. But uh, there are some family members here who are here for the first time, and that is Sarah's brother, Mr. Matthew, and his wife, Sally. And my brother, John, who is here with his family and shares the same with <laughs> Sarah. And my daughter Priya and her friends, I don't know if she Priya is coming here. Run away. Okay, just come. Okay. Uh, she'll be mentioned again. Uh, let me tell you the origin of this uh, lecture. Uh, several years ago, uh, I had surprised my wife Sarah uh, on her 50th birthday and nearly the 30th anniversary of our marriage by arranging with Professor Goldman, Professor Poulos, and Berkeley, uh, a chair called the Sarah Kaila Chair, of which the whole, first holder was a distinguished Professor Goldman, who was here. Now, Sarah was uh, not very happy with this, because she's a very publicity-averse person. And she agreed to attend the inauguration, which was done by the uh, famous Indian uh, astrophysicist and Nobel laureate, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. But after that, she did not want any uh, events which named her. Now, she passed away in 2008 after a long battle with cancer, where she beat the odds by far. She was given six months. She did five and a half. And in those years, she regarded them as most of the, about 80 or 90 percent of the time, she was blessed with reasonable health. But she had started a charitable trust some years earlier, but the cancer accelerated her efforts. And I see after one of our first managers, Ash, uh, Alo uh, Sangupta, who once remarked that one night she got 10 emails from Sarah about uh, some of the trust matters. Well, after her passing, I decided to override her wishes and inaugurate the lecture. And this, uh, the, uh, it has been a distinguished uh, set of lectures, and uh, it will be added to by our present lecture. 
And I was particularly uh, captured by the title, Philanthropy, an Option or a Necessity. And when I think, can, can you hear me, sir? At the back? Uh, because it, it, for Sarah, I think it was a necessity. And uh, it, it brought to mind a story that one of her schoolmates had sent to us on the occasion when she passed away. In some very lower grade, one day in, in a village in Kerala where she grew up, the teacher was very harsh with a student sitting there saying, how come you are here? Your parents haven't paid the tuition. You have no right to be here, so don't come back tomorrow unless the tuition is paid. So after the class, Sarah went up to this girl and said, what's the problem? She said, oh, my parents are going through a difficult time right now and they can't afford it. Well, Sarah had two, two gold bangles on her hand and she took them off and gave it to her and said, you know, give this to your parents and let them work with it and when they are able to repay, they can repay. So that's astonishing because if a young girl goes home and says, what happened to your bangles? So I just gave them to someone. But uh, fortunately, her parents were pretty broad-minded and applauded her decision, actually. And uh, all her life, actually, one of the things that, that gave her the greatest pleasure was making other people happy. And she devoted a lot of her energy to that. And uh, I'm happy to say uh, Priya is now here, our uh, youngest daughter, third uh, child, is uh, following in her mother's footsteps and has started a charity which she's named after her mother uh, in Hayward, California. So uh, the inspiration lives on. The topics of the lecture, which is again appropriate, was uh, uh, I drew inspiration from it from my uh, friend, Dr. Anu Maitra, and now my wife. And she uh, said, you know, this is going to be the century of women. And more and more attention needs to be paid to them. And uh, so we chose the topic, women and leadership. And uh, it has been a good topic. The first, very first speaker was Kamala Harris, who at that time was running for Attorney General of California, and now is running for the Senate. And uh, now our fourth speaker is uh, Mrs. Murthy. And I must say, we, I don't know if they've made it yet, but there's an organization in the South Bay called Indians for Collective Action. And they too have set up a program at Bhupan Mehta and PK Mehta for Indians of Collective Action should be here. And they have a program also called Sarah Kaila Women's Leadership Program, which, where they pick up potential women leaders in India and give them training and support as they go back. So, the topic for me is personally very uh, uh, moving, and I would just like to if, uh, give the chair back to Lawrence, and who will. Thank you all. So I face a challenge. Um, there are many Sudamurtis, and it's very hard to talk about them all. And because they're all quite well known, there are many stories about Sudamurti that circulate widely. And so when I ventured to tell our honored speaker in advance of which stories I was going to tell, she said, not that story again, and this one and that one. So but fortunately, uh, she offered some to me new ones, um, I hope to you. Uh, and I will try to cut out the ones that are uh, tried and true. They're all good stories because they really do exemplify the question of leadership, particularly in, in fighting uh, sexist exclusions. So um, this is uh, Sudhamurthy's second visit to Berkeley. She came here in 2007. We're grateful she could come back. But her ties to Berkeley run deep. Her younger brother, Caltech professor, Dr. Srinivas Kulkarni, got his PhD in astronomy in the late 1970s here. In fact, our sources reveal that he met his wife, Kurumi Komia, uh, who is here at the International House um, when uh, she was an exchange student from Japan working on her PhD in biochemistry. So we're very delighted, there's other family members here now, we're very delighted to continue the tradition of this family at Berkeley. Sudha Murthy has a master's degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Science, uh, Bangalore. 
It's more than that. In 1968, she was the only girl in her engineering college. Uh, the story I will tell you, um, and I hope I get it right, because I've just learned this story, is uh, um, uh, Mrs. Morty's father, who was a doctor, small town, uh, said, you're very, very good with people. Uh, you should be um, a doctor working with women. Um, her mother, a teacher, Mathematics said you should be a mathematician. <laughs> the, um, there were several other leading people in her life. You know, uh, I think it was her grandfather. But I, uh, uh, she reads voluminously, not just writes voluminously, particularly in history. And so uh, she was telling me that before she went to Iran, given a long time fascination both with Persian the relevance of Persian to Canada, that she was reading many, many books and became somewhat of an expert in the subject. So grandfather said you should be a historian. Um, in fact, the only thing she was told not to do by many was to become an engineer because there could not be a, there were no women in the college. The head of the college said she's very smart. Yes, she'll get in. That's a good thing. But, but that we have to build a, a restroom for her. And, uh, <laughs> and then after she leaves, no woman will ever come again. And so what's the point? What will she do with this? And her grandmother said, you'll never be able to get married in our community. Uh, and person after, you know, a person immense, you cannot do this. Um, so all these possible careers, to be a doctor, noble profession, to be uh, a mathematician, um, to uh, be a historian. She chose, of course, being an engineer. Um, and uh, there are the stories I won't tell you, but the story after story, position after position, she's told she cannot apply for a job, she's told she cannot do this, and she finds a way forward in, in rather heroic ways. Um, uh, okay. She would go on, I'm jumping ahead from the stories I will not tell you, to multiple other careers. She is, of course, an accomplished Kanda writer. She has, at her last count, 25 books and over 100 other significant publications to her credit. She has received many awards, multiple honorary doctorates. Her work has been translated into many languages, and she lectures in many countries around the world. She leaves here uh, to go to uh, Sarjana, to the Emirates, and then to Kuwait. Um, but she is as famous a philanthropist as she is an engineer and novelist. If I may cite, and I apologize for this, because it lionizes her career, but it's an article from the newspaper The Telegraph. Here is a story that is truly stranger than fiction. A small town doctor's daughter, and I cite the journalist, uh, from North Karnataka marries an engineer who soars meteorically through the corporate world and becomes a globally respected billionaire. The doctor's daughter becomes a multimillionaire in her own right, and writing in her spare time, she becomes one of India's top-selling, most prominent novels. Unlikely though it may seem, her morality tales always revolve around the evils of wealth and how it alters people for the worse." Unquote. If the story of India's top engineers over the past quarter century is one of phenomenal, perhaps unexpected, and globally unparalleled success, what are the ethics of this success? How does one live? Mrs. Murti is famous not just for her philanthropy, but for the choices she's made in this philanthropy, as in part an answer to this pressing question. Her focus is multiple, significantly on education, for sustaining many programs, such as the Akshay Patra, the Unlimited Food for Education program. Um, but these are, um, she has many other programs, um, but these are not separate worlds, the philanthropy, the novels. Um, her, her work is a response to this meteoric transformation of Indian science and technology. Um, all of her work, the writing, the novels, the philanthropy converge in making a claim for a sustained moral vision as a response to this transformation, to the emergence of a new Indian world through engineering. And it is this vision that she will share with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming uh, Sudha Murthy. Good evening, distinguished people. Normally, 
normally I don't want to give lectures because I really feel there's nothing I can talk about. Well, uh, my work is probably, I love my work so much that every day is a holiday for me. <laughs> so how do you spend your holiday? Nobody can describe it. Um, but I have great respect for Tom, uh, for his academic you know, excellence he has achieved in his life. And though I have not met Sarah, my sister knew her very well. And, uh, so whenever I meet Tom, he said, your lecture is due, and I said, okay, let me do it now. I'll finish all my lecture series of this year. Um, when I tell about uh, philanthropy, is a must or not, is a necessity or is it, there are many ways to get off. But I just want to tell you a story before I start because I used to teach computer science in Bangalore University 15 years back and I became more irregular than my own students because of my work schedule was so tight and then I said I will not continue, I will be on the board. The best way I think you can escape is be on the board when you don't have to teach. So, when I used to teach, I was quite popular because it's an hour lecture and out of that 45 minutes I will teach and remain 15 minutes. That everything is okay because you are the one who is recording. <laughs> you are a teacher. <laughs> then I don't need a mic at all. <laughs> so last 15 minutes I will tell a story. After many years, my students have done extremely well in uh, their careers, and I meet them quite often, different parts of the world, in Bangalore, in different areas. And I ask them, tell me, I taught you so many things, Java, C++, Spark, database management, management, decision-making, risk-taking, etc. Which one was very useful in the real life? Most of them say, ma'am, we don't remember any one of them, but we remember your stories. <laughs> because stories are so powerful, and they convey what exactly you want to tell it was in a very subtle way. This is a true story and I have taken his permission to tell this story. Uh, Vishnu was my student, the name of Yavichi. Vishnu was my student, very bright. And I love my students like my own children. You know? We have debate, disagreement, differences, but at the end you love your children. So I used to really like Vishnu and uh, he got his degree. You know, I used to teach computer science in a master's in Christ University in Bangalore in those days. So we had a shortage of uh, lab teachers. So I told Vishnu, uh, he got a job in Microsoft Seattle. So we signed all it will take some time. So three months he was sitting at home. I said, why can't you come and teach? And he was an excellent teacher. So when he got his visa, he was about to leave. And, I told Vishnu, you are such a good teacher. Everyone likes you. You like subject. Why can't you continue as a teacher? He said, no, ma'am. I don't agree with you. I want to go to US. I want to make lots of money. And uh, I said, uh, Vishnu, lots of money doesn't mean lots of happiness. He said, ma'am, your belly is full. You can afford to talk. <laughs> well, that kind of freedom I have with my students, you know. Um, I said, it has nothing to do with belly. Beta, it is... Uh, Philosophy of life is what I have seen. He says, no ma'am, I don't agree with you at all. What salary you get in a year, I can get in a month. I said, okay. Then I do not want to tell you anything more than this. He left. And uh, many years passed. I was middle-aged, I became old. I came to old age and 10, 15 years, I think, must have passed. And one day, I was in my office and that time I became only on the you know, Christ University board, I stopped teaching because I couldn't take the load of teaching as well as my work. One day, there was a call, my secretary was telling somebody that man is super busy, no time, etc. I said, with whom you are arguing? He said, only five, that's I said, only ten minutes I want to be. I said, there's a person by the name Vishnu, someone like that, he wants to meet you. Because there are many people, when, at least I'm talking with respect to India. They say, oh, you know, Mrs. Murthy, extremely well. I may not even know. I was a classmate. <laughs> Something that kind they tell so that they should get through the call. So she said, ma'am, there's one person who by the name Vishnu morning he called. I told him no, but again he's calling. And I said, I know four Vishnus. Which Vishnu you ask? Then he said, tell her her first batch student. Then I said, give him time. Some slot. She said, I don't have any slot, maybe. 
your lunch time, I'll cut it. I said, fine, it doesn't matter. Tell him to join me for lunch, I can talk to him. Because I believe old memories, old wine, and old students are precious. And <laughs> I said, let me talk to my students after all. You know, it's such joy to talk to them after many years. So Vishnu came in and I was having lunch. I said, Vishnu, you want to share? He said, no, I had my lunch. And I looked at Vishnu, Vishnu looked at me, he said, ma'am, you look old. I said, of course, time and time will not be old. <laughs> and I don't uh, dye my hair, so I have to be old. I went to a film party, and except me, everybody had a dark hair. I said, I'm the oldest there. Someone said, no, you're the only one who's honest because you're not happy. <laughs> anyway, I looked at Vishnu, he was wearing a very good shirt and a good, probably a Rolex watch, everything was fine, but he was not happy. That's what I felt. I said, let me keep quiet, let me, because normally women talk more, mothers talk more, teachers talk more, and I'm a mother and a teacher and a woman. <laughs> so, I will talk more, so let me not talk more, let me allow my student to talk more. I said, Vishnu, how is everything? He said, I'm fine. I said, where did you live? Uh, then, he said, uh, I came, he said, oh, I, I, I live in many places, I said, uh, I knew only God can. Are you with the mother of soft? He said, ma'am, you are old fashioned. Do you expect me to stay in a software company for 12 long years? <laughs> that is like your time, you know, you could join a company and stay there for the next 25 years. My, I mean, my era, three years is maximum. So I said, where do you stay now? He said, I have a house in a French colony, a defense colony in Delhi. Then I have a house in Sadashiva Nagar, Bangalore, then I have a house in Singapore. I said, no, I'm not an income tax person to know. I'm <laughs> where do you really live? He said, between Singapore and Bangalore and Delhi. Then he said, I have my own company, there are 200 people are working. Then I said, it looks very nice. Then I said, are you married? He said, yes, I have a daughter. He opened his purse, showed his wife's photograph. She was just like a model, very beautiful. A daughter's photograph, very nice thing. I said, Vishnu, everything looks nice. You are well off because you told your house in Sadashiva Nagar, which is so expensive, a Delhi French colony, and uh, almost, and you have 200 people working for you, your wife is as beautiful as the mattress, and you have a daughter. It is a perfect life. He said, No, ma'am, I'm not happy. I remember when Vishnu was in college, he used to go out with one girl. In my time, if you go out with the boy, you have to marry him. Be careful, okay? That is my time. Times have changed. You can go out and marry someone else also. That things have changed. So, but this girl, you know, model girl, was not that girl. Her father was a postmaster, I knew. So I said, okay. Vishnu said, ma'am, I'm not happy. And uh, that's the reason I've come to see you. I said, better I'm not a Guruji or somebody who can give you happiness in a package. <laughs> or a yoga guru in seven yoga posture, you will get happiness. Or a Reiki guru. I'm not, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a very ordinary computer science teacher and a philanthropist. So in what way I can give you what you're asking or give the formula for happiness? I don't have that. He says, uh, Mom, please listen to me. What I feel I want to tell you, I'm traveling. I'm traveling in a desert with no water. I can see an oasis, but I'm all alone. And there's no shade, and I'm tired. I said, you're talking like me, like a writer. You tell me what, what you mean by that. He said, I feel I'm very lonely, I'm very unhappy, and I can't share anything with anybody. <coughs> Wait a minute. He said, how many friends do you have? He said, how do you define a friend? Depending on that. I said, I define a friend, male or a female, with whom I can shamelessly, openly, without any condition, tell about what I feel, without any hesitation. I can share my thoughts, my joys, more than my joys, my sorrows. He said, if that is your definition, I don't have any. And I said, how do you, 15 years you never know any friends? He said, ma'am, in business, when I was building business, I thought, 
If I meet Mr. X, I should have an advantage with Mr. X or Miss X. In the sense, it should be a business connection. So I will meet that person. I will get some contact. Every person or hub of contact. I meet you, something I get from you. I'll, with that help, I meet someone else, I get something. All the time, meeting a person means for me nothing but a business contact. So how will I develop a friendship? I said that is true. Because in life, you cannot live on a transaction. It's nice to have good business. But life is not business. Life is relationship. In life, in relationship, there should be unconditional love. In unconditional love, there is give and take. I said, then I said, uh, you don't have me. I said, then you are married. You can open up with your wife. He said, no. My wife is a daughter of a very well-known carpet businessman. She owns a carpet company and she supplies carpet all over, exports carpet. And she asked me over a dinner table, who are your richest clients? She will update her data so that she can sell carpets to them. <laughs> so wife takes husband as a hub of, or a point of contact for her business and he takes her for point of contact with his business. I said, you have a child. Child is one. Someone was asking you what is, how much it costs somewhere. I said, in this life everything is plus and minus. Okay? Give and take. There is only one unconditional love. It's a mother's love. There is the only thing in life there is no... There is actually there is nothing give and take, it's only take. For a child it's only take. For a mother it's only give. So that you have a daughter. So it's an unconditional love of a child. You can be friend. You can get so much time you can spend with your children. He said, my daughter is super smart. Between both parents she will judge who is weak, at what time. She will ask something. I said, no, I can't give. She goes to mother and puts in a different way. And mother agrees. When mother says no, she comes to me and I agree. So, she can gauge the psychology of the parents. Actually, that is true. I have seen smaller children are not innocent. Actually, they are, they are smarter than they are. <laughs> so, she said, my daughter, you know, I never feel like, you know, opening up or a child. Like she's, there is no innocence of child, you know. Yeah. She's very calculative. I said, uh, what are you doing? He said, I went to a psychiatrist in New York. He told me, your heart, in your heart there is no compassion. There is nothing to give without taking. It's not taking. And that could be one of the that could be one of the reasons that you have become like this. So he arranged a trip for me to Somalia. I said, look, I knew a trip to Niagara, Grand Canyon, Thailand. Recently I went to Iran. Iran trip was also arranged. But trip to Somalia, I have never seen. And we sell software to many places, but Somalia, we never even gone. He said, ma'am, I went to Somalia because someone told me, go to Somalia, you see big children, children on the street, <coughs> desperate children, crying mothers, so your heart will melt. I said, did it melt? He said, no, I went there. I saw what can we export from software. <laughs> what your manganese is good, iron ore is good, what is that? I said, Vishnu, that is the problem. In the last 12 years, you must have earned a lot, a lot. More than you told me the quote that what teachers can earn in one year, I can earn in a month. You must have earned thousand times more than a teacher can earn. You have Made all the things, all the contacts, human beings are business contact. And that is the reason you are, and you know, I thought in my mind, he got married to this lady here, carpet businessman, because of the contact, not a postman's daughter, because there is no contact with the postman, that are giving letters. <laughs> so I said, look, you have made very simple rules in life. A human being is used, but not a bridge is made between two human beings. Every human being is an island. I am an island, however good or bad, I am an island and you are an island. And one human being to another human being, we can connect only through a bridge and bridge is the relationship. How do you make a bridge when somebody is in difficulty? 
you have to help. Uh, that means the steel is used. When somebody is anxious, tell them a few solace words. That means a cement cast is made. When someone wants physically something, go and give. The road is made of the bridge. It takes time better to make a bridge. It is not like overnight to make a bridge. So is human relationship. And this takes time. And this time is non product according to you, non useful to you. Because what is the business in that between two people? But that is the secret of life. In life, earning money is not the only thing. Spending that in a proper way, either with words at times. People think philanthropy means always money. No. Part of it is money. There are many things in philanthropy. A kind word, a good gesture. Someone go and help physically, appreciating something, what somebody has done. Everything is philanthropy. Philanthropy is very, very beautifully defined in so many ways, in so many cultures. In Greek culture, they say phil means fellow, philanthropy is fellow, love the fellow human beings. Rich or poor, love your fellow human beings. Don't expect anything from that fellow. Just love how God loves us. Just love that person. If someone is in a dire difficulty, share whatever you have. And that makes you a better human being for your sake, not for that person's sake. It makes you a normal human being. It keeps your head above your shoulder. And that is what our ancestors have told. Somebody asked a question in Mahabharata. They say, when you earn a lot of money, what happens? When you earn a lot of money, what happens? What do you do with that money? To earn that money, you will hear you work hard, struggle, at times cheat, lie, but you make a lot of money. What do you do with that money? Wait for a minute and think, what do you do with a lot of money? One is, you can enjoy. You can hire your own jet. You can go. You can stay in a seven-star hotel. You can eat whatever you want, but after certain age, you can't eat whatever you want. <laughs> and whatever you want, you eat when you are young. It shows when you are old. <laughs> the effect of that. Tell me more. You can wear dress, very good dress. What is very good dress? A golden dress, very heavy. A golden rice cannot eat. What you will do with a lot of money? It is an insecure mind feels lot of money means lot of security. A secure mind, a mind which understands other human beings, a mind which loves fellow human beings, lot of money means lot of donation. That's all. A lot of money means lot of giving. That's all the use of money. Suppose you don't do all those things, but you have a lot of money, what you will do? Because how much you can eat, how much you can fly, how much you can drink, how much you can weigh, there is an end for that. Then you leave that money to your children. Now children get this kind of money without hard work. Suddenly there is a lot of money for children without hard work. Then they will, their life is destroyed. Please remember, when children get a lot of money, without understanding the source of money, how it is generated, how hard it is, you know, parents have worked, it is the worst way to give children so that they will go, they will use it in a very wrong way. If you don't either of them, either of them, then this money should be given in dana or given. Taitriya Upanishad, 33 standard in the Upanishad, which tells, in olden days, in India, when children used to stay with, not with parents, but with Rishi or the teachers, they used to stay through the in-house uh, boarding school in those days. They were talking about 2000 years back. The last day when the, the mother was the teacher's wife and the father was the teacher, that's the way, that's the in Upanishad, we say the third line in Upanishad says, Acharyam Devo Bhava, that is, O oh, teacher, you are third in the hierarchy, I salute you. Teacher played a very important role in one's life. And when the student decided to go home, he gives him 33 standard how one should live in life. And that he says, Dhanam Priyavad Saitam. Oh my child, when you grow and make a lot of money, please remember, it is meant to give others. It is not your own money. The money of what you earn is definitely part of the society's money. You own it. It has to go back to society. When you give, give with kind words. Take money and get lost is not correct. 
you may you take this money and prosper you should say danam priya vaksahitam shraddha hi danam you should believe in that cause no i will i will scratch your back you scratch my this never a dana i will give you without expecting anything from you this dana and ashraddha hi dana you don't believe in it don't ever give that money so the simple truth of life i told vishnu you have never learned to give anything without expectation everything is a picture perfect you are a beautiful wife and you are a child does not require any role model outside parents are the role model they have seen you and your wife the way you transact each other your child has become exactly a replica of yours she will take advantage of parents because she knows which is which line is weaker at that moment and that's the reason with this kind of a money this kind of a beautiful wife with a family why you are not happy you have never given anything to others and that is the curse with the money you got it money is never a curse money not giving to others and keeping to yourself all the time is a curse and this is a simple thing in life you must learn when you make money you have a duty towards society this is age old saying you should give away because giving away is good for you and that's the reason philanthropy is a must for all of us because it makes our life better it makes our life better it makes us to understand fellow human beings it makes us to be at peace in within ourselves there is no competition you make 10000 dollars there is a person who made 20 somebody made 2 million then he said okay i made 4 million somebody made 1 billion suppose he say i made 1 billion then the bill gets sitting there <laughs> okay please remember when you compete with money there is no end but when you compete in giving there is always a slide this is one field the more you give the more slide you get unlike other things you know the more money are the more sarees i have more headache it is the more luxury i have then i get used to that but the more dana or helping others gives me more solace and this is a part of life it is like you know how you brush your teeth how you study every day philanthropy should be part of life someone told me says murti it is easy to talk when i become your age then i will start i said it will be too late start when you are young not only with money money may or may not be possible everybody cannot be rich but kind words are god's gift somebody is in difficulty so you have to help them i was asking some people you know earlier it was what is dharma dharma means not religion dharma means the definition of dharma means somebody is falling from the top helplessly and you stop it and that is god dharma and you know someone in any kind of difficulty you help that is dharma not the ritual I will give one more because I have only half an hour time. I want to. It's very difficult to finish in half an hour time, but I will try to give more time. I will give one more example. This is the, I am very keen to tell. Infosys Foundation is 20 years old, and 20 years back I was here. I did not know how to do philanthropy. How, what are the simple rules of that? What is the exit policy? All those. So one day. I decided, you know, there's a story why I started uh, working. That's a different story. I decided uh, to start philanthropy, and we had Infosys Foundation. My father asked me, "Tell me, uh, what is your main agenda? Whom you want to help?" I told, "I want to eradicate um, prostitute or sex workers in Karnataka." My father took a pity at me and smiled and did not reply. He was a man. as in many more rainy seasons so just didn't reply and you know i wore a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and i had a bobbed hair i went to the ap center of the devadasi system devadasi is a old system in karnataka it was there in india 3000 years back there were dancers and musicians who were dedicated to the worship of god and they held in a high esteem in, during you know 2000 years back to the chalukya very dynasty Over a period of time, Devadasi's 
when the kingdoms disappeared, they became sex workers. Today, you, if somebody is a Devdasi, you can equate them to a sex worker. There's a place, epicenter, there where Devdasi were converted. Now they are reduced, but still they are there. They were working and uh, they were, all of them sitting in a group and I went there and I told, look, I have come to help you people. There is a disease by the name AIDS, it has come and it's very important in your profession, it is more relevant. I want to help you people. I took a notebook and pencil and I went and they looked at me. They said, who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm a social worker. They said, just get lost. You may be a social worker, but we don't have to listen to you. You may write our story and make money, so we don't want to talk to you. I said, no, I have come with a real reason and all. They took, some of them got so upset with me, they took a chapel, slippers and threw at me. I came back, I was quite disappointed. I really wanted to help them because their life is a difficult time. And I felt very genuinely I wanted to help and they threw slippers at me. After 15 days, again I said, let me try again. When I went there, the tomato season, the harvest, and you know, not tomato. They were segregating, and again I would go there and I tell them, Look, I want to help you, please give your name, etc. They said, Same lady has come who wants to help, but they made fun of me. They threw tomato at me. <laughs> I came back. And I started crying. I said, Why I should do all those things? I have a very good job. I'm a professor of computer science, and my husband is quite well off, and my children were in college. I said, why should I do all those things, getting a chapel, slippers one side, second time tomato, I should not do. My father asked me, he was an old man, he was a doctor. He said, uh, why are you crying? I said, you know, I did like this. He said, come here. Did you see yourself in a mirror? I said, no, I don't see mirror because I don't require. I'm not missing here. Why should I see 20 times a day mirror? I just put a bindi, middle two eyebrows, I know how to put it. He said, no, I want to see your image in a mirror. I saw, I said, what is that? There's no change. He said, look, look at you. You wear a pair of uh, trousers and a t-shirt and a bobbed hair and no big deal, nothing. You go there in an area where these sex workers with no education are living. And you talk about AIDS and, and remove, you know, helping them, etc. How they can identify you with them? You are, a, you know, a, an unknown person to them. You should understand in, in philanthropy or if you are in any public work, you you should they should people should identify so that they can share their difficulty. They won't, nobody will share with you. He said you change your dress, wear a sari, wear a bindi, wear a mangal sutra that is a married people wear in Karnataka, and then you go and talk to them. I said no, I don't believe in external appearance. I always believe in the ultimate. I know. What, what is my real worth? He said, okay, the decision is between you. Are you so much worried about your dress or are you worried about the end results? About a week, I thought of it. I should wear a sari, wear a mangas, but I really don't believe in it. Then I said, okay, what is my ultimate aim? Devadasis should rehabilitate. Let me do that. Then I went and bought 200 rupees of mangal sutra, tied my hair, wore 200 rupees sari. Then my father said, I will come with you. Both of us went there. And uh, my father said, you don't come, I will talk to them. He, then he went and talked, how is the weather, you had a proper rains, all those things. I was thinking, why is he wasting time beating the bush? <laughs> and then my father said, uh, what are your children doing? They said, somebody is studying, somebody is not studying. He said, look, my daughter is going to give you scholarship to all those children. And I was very upset, I never told that. <laughs> the old man has made his own story, maybe because he's my father, no? Story writing <laughs> I told my father in a different dialect, I called him because I speak about seven, eight languages. I called him and told him, how did you promise without asking me? He said, just keep quiet. And he came back and told me, a woman, if the woman's weakest spot is children. If you want to help Devdasis or sex workers, please help her children first. Then she will listen to you. Instead of talking about AIDS and all, they get scared. First you talk about their children. You do not know human psychology. The best way to get mother is through her children. Because if you tell your child is a great, every mother will be very happy. Similarly, you tell your these dear ladies that I will help your children. And my relationship with them started helping their children and talking to them. They never knew about Infosys. They never knew about my name. It was an advantage to me. They called me Akka. Akka in Kannada means sister. I became their sister and they never had share market or the 
uh, uh, you know, what is the Infosys uh, share price, etc. They never knew. Good, they were never knew. They, then my father said, she is my daughter, she is a school teacher. I said, why are you lying? He said, are you not a teacher? I said, yes. How does it matter, a college teacher or a school teacher? Both are same. <laughs> so, I got a respect because I am a teacher. I got a respect because I wear a Mangal Sutra. I got respect because, you know, I look like them wearing that kind of sari. I got respect because I am helping these children. My work with sex workers started. And slowly I became their friend and then they started telling their problems and many people told how they were sold in the market. But horrible stories, one after another. Everybody would come and cry in front of me. And they never wanted any solution for that. They wanted one word I realized, it was not your fault. And everybody wanted that answer from me, it was not your fault. The situation was like that. And then I met a very nice young energetic person by the name Abhay. Know, who, who became a full-time help in my work. We established and registered organization for the sex workers. We got many facilities from government. And 17 years passed. They, they started a bank. Now they say they came back. 3,000 of them actually re were reunited 17 years. My father told me when I cried, he told me, this is one of the oldest profession in the world ever since the human race has started. Don't say, I will eradicate. You can say, I can reduce it. Don't say, I can remove it. And in my lifetime, if you can rehabilitate seven, uh, ten sex workers to normal life, I'll be very proud father. I gave birth to a daughter who could rehabilitate ten sex workers. When my father died of heart attack, I could rehabilitate only seven. In 17 years, we rehabilitated 3,000 of them. In that district, there was absolutely no sex worker. We took care. I got a threatening mail, threatening calls. You come to that area, we will break your both legs. Somebody said, we will do this, we will do that. We will, uh, you know, you come in a car, we will throw the bomb in your car, etc. But then I took a police protection at times. Then I will go in a different name. I will reserve my uh, railway ticket with a different name, but still I will go. And people realize that my intentions were pure, without expectation. And sex workers realized this was really I'm their sister. They said, we want to start a bank. I said, of, of course you start. I will get you a building. And 3,000 of them became a shareholder, started a bank. We got a bank person to come and train them. Their children became engineers, doctors, police constables, uh, nurses, many small, big positions they took in the society. Then they said, Akka, you have worked for us for 18 long years and we want to honor you. I said, no, no, I don't require it. But I understood their mind by that time that it is not the honor. It is They wanted to say thank you in their own way. I said, fine, I will come. They said, we will send you uh, up and you know, return ticket by Volvo air condition bus. That is their concept of luxury. And each one of them gave 100 rupees for this function. There were three lakh or 300,000 rupees. I went to the function. And all of them came in their, their saris, whatever they could wear, with their children. And I told three of them can come and talk about their experience. And they talked how they were tortured by the pins and how they came out of it. And somebody threw acids on them and how we helped them to get operated. How we give, actually we, they wanted a loan to get a Bishima fellow and uh, nobody gave them a bank guarantee. I said, okay, I will stand as a bank guarantee. And my husband would tell that he's the only person I've seen he's issuing a bank guarantee for 3,000 people. And if they cheat, I said, Murthy, any rich man can cheat me, but my poor sex workers will never cheat. They never cheated. I knew that very well by that time, 18 years. Nobody cheated. They had their own small businesses where they can earn a certain amount of money every month. And they were out of the clutches of the pimps, everything, and the children were you know, well educated. And my turn came to speak or address them. They all were waiting what I will talk. I'm an extempore speaker. Even today I told I don't have any prepared slides, nothing. I always speak from my heart. And I always I don't have a great memory power, so I won't lie. Because once you lie, you should remember what I lied last time. <laughs> then only you can continue. And every time I should remember what I lied. So best is tell truth. Then you can no taxing on your brain. So I said, I don't require an overhead projector. 
because I tell the truth all the time, you record or no record, it's the same. So everybody was waiting, and I'm an extempore speaker, and I stand there the first time I was unable to speak. I was choked. I was just choked. And I was thinking about what is philanthropy there, standing in front of 3,000 people. Philanthropy is love fellow human beings. And is it a must? Yes, it's a must. Look in front of me, there are 3,000 families. A woman is a family in, the, in the sex workers. A woman means a family member, head of the family. 3,000 heads of the family. And you know, I was thinking about my life with their life. I was thinking, I went to engineering college in 1968, where it was unheard a lady joining engineering college. It is as good as a taboo that she doesn't have a brain, so she went to engineering college. And when my husband started Infosys company, he said, you should give money so that I can start the company. I had 10,250 rupees. I gave him 10,000 out of it, which is very impractical way because never knew Infosys may come up or may go down and my 10,000 money also will go without save over three years. I was impractical to give money. I was impractical to get into engineering college. I was impractical to leave my very good engineering career and became a teacher and a philosopher. Everything, all decisions were in the eyes of the world, were impractical. But in the terms of the philanthropy, I was always practical. I was always done what I was supposed to do. Otherwise, it was my duty to help my husband when he really wanted a desire to build an empire. Later, it became an empire, a small village. It was my heart which said, I must do engineering because I must cut a path. And today, when I go back to engineering college, there are in computer science, there are 60% of them are girls. In instrumentation, there are 50% of them. In mechanical, there are 35% of the girls. When I look, I always think it was worth it. My journey was worth it. Many times I ask this question, why was I born to get into all these things? I should have really relaxed. I said, no. I said, God, I really want to thank you. You gave me an extraordinary life, a life I can touch 3,000 families. You gave me an extraordinary career, a career of philanthropy, better than a director of any technical company. You gave me an extraordinary opportunity to serve your children who are in difficulties. I served your children, and in return, they made me a better human being. And this is the magic touch of philanthropy. It is a must in everyone's life. It makes you very mature. It makes you down to earth. It makes you heart fulfilled. And then I told God, I have completed my circle. A circle I started with nothing. And the circle today, 3,000 people enjoy a free life, clutches of the pin and sex work. And this is only because of your kindness. And the word philanthropy I understood by my ancestors. If you are not philanthropist, you are not a human being at all, I realized. And I said, I don't have any complaints to anybody. My life certainly is fulfilled due to philanthropy. Thank you very much for patience. <laughs>
Are you trying to write any books in Marathi? Yes, when it's not Marathi. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I know seven, eight languages. Marathi is uh, one of them and it's very dear to me because I live in Pune. Um, I will not be able to write in Marathi. I always write in English and Kannada both. And my books will be translated into Marathi. I think Marathi, or my, I have some 15 books in Marathi. Don't get after. <laughs> no, I mean, it's very inspiring. Thank you. And I, I mean, your message is absolutely right on. And there are people here who are already doing it and will continue. But Infosys Foundation is a large foundation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the other? Akshay Patra was one of them, yeah. but some, some other things that we may not know about. Yeah, Infosys Foundation is a uh, charity wing of Infosys and uh, we spend around uh, uh, how much in, in uh, uh, I don't know, 50, 50 million dollars uh, uh, almost 50 million dollars a year and we are only 5 people. I see. Our ORS are less than 0.5 percent. Uh, we work all day. We enjoy our work and I say every, work, every day is a holiday. We work all over India. This year we started working in Northeast because it was a neglected area. We work in medical. Uh, we work in higher education. Like last year, we instituted 10 checks. But we have to work only in India. There is a CSR <coughs> group Sunday. We instituted 10 checks in uh, Chennai Mathematical Institute, Triple IIT, IIT, uh, Ames Delhi, in many places, you know, higher education, cancer research, etc. We have scholarship programs. Then we do a midday meal program. Uh, we build kitchen and also pay money for the every child. Uh, we work on uh, art and culture. It is dying art we divide. We document arts also. Um, then rescue, rural development we do. Uh, we have built roads, bridges, and a plus national calamities. Like this year, there's a good road operation. We're building 3,000 houses. We have built 13,000 toilets. 60,000 library books we have given. Um, then 3,000 houses we built in floods in northern, in southern Maharashtra and northern Karnataka. Uh, so many things we have done. A lot actually. But we do all in India. This year Infosys uh, Foundation USA has started here in the area uh, under Vishal Singh. But details I will not know. I know I am responsible only for India. Does, does the Infosys company give a certain percentage? Yeah, 2% of their profit. 2%. And I feel that's really good because I only feel, I wish they should have given 20 years back when I was young, I would have done a lot more work. But, uh, but still, no, it's not bad. Okay. Still, I can work as a 4 or 5 years, I suppose. And uh, I worked in Jammu, uh, Kashmir, everywhere. Everywhere you can see that. First of all, thank you for coming. Uh, yes. I, I had one question. Like you mentioned, the importance of donation. Uh, what are your thoughts about like lending, like micro lending or something like that? So, like this is a constant struggle which goes on in my mind as well as I think in many people's mind that sometimes when you donate the money, uh, when there is no obligation of giving it back without any interest or anything you are actually not helping that other person. He may become reliant on you yourself itself. So what were, what were your experiences in that and what are your thoughts about micro lending? Okay. Listen. Um, actually, when we give money, we have certain principles in that. By giving money, you should never make people dependent. There should be an exit policy. Like we never help anyone more than three years, sometimes five years. Exception is these uh, sex workers. We help them for a long time actually. Because it took some time for them to come out of it. By and large, there should be an exit policy. In, in uh, Orissa, when I was working, there was a set of people. They were always kept poor. Whenever somebody comes, show them, okay, this is the tribe which is poor. And over a period of time, they became like, like an exhibit in the exhibition. You know, people will come look at them and give money. That is never a philosophy, making people killing the initiative. You should hold their hand in such a way that every year should go on reducing the donation and winning it and then make it zero and they should be on their own. 
We are only helping hand. You are not there forever. Now coming to microfinance and all, you can do that. It's not uh, very difficult, but you should have a very good governance in that. And you require a, a good establishment for that to govern. And again, it depends on you know which area you do. For example, a state of Bengal, a state of Bengal and state of Kerala, where women are more educated and where women have more control than men, actually. That's a fact from, I'm sure uh, you are from Kerala, you know. Women are smarter there, particularly with their background. And so is Bengal. There you can do microfinance better than any other, any other state. A, pla a place like Bihar and UP, you will cannot do. Because men are stronger and if woman wants to do that, man will not allow her to do that one. He will, uh, wife may be a chairman, but the real chairman will be a husband sitting at home. So it, it depends on the social structure of each state. Please remember, India is not a country, it's a continent. It has many countries inside. And every, every state has its own culture. So you have to be very careful what project you apply. For example, uh, according to me, Gujarat is the place, anybody is Gujarati here? Gujarat is one place where you can do the best of the social work. Because by and large, Gujaratis, you know, do not exhibit their wealth. You can't make out the person who is sitting next to you, you may be a billionaire, but he will wear the same or she will wear the same sari. But yeah, you will. Okay? It is not a showing of Punjabi can't do that. <laughs> Punjabi is actually so different. So every state, like Gujarat, there is not a single in uh, um, uh, there is not a single person left without any help, for example, uh, a deaf, dumb and uh, cycle, etc. Because uh, there is one state where you can implement your things faster than any state. Then there comes Maharashtra. It is more more uh, open state than any other state. Anyone is from Maharashtra, you are there. Maharashtra is more open state. Any women oriented policy we have applied for with education is first to implement in Maharashtra. Teacher training, women's teacher training we do first in Maharashtra. So every state we have to weigh pros and cons and we should do. It is not like you know just go ahead blindly, no. And medically the best is Tamil Nadu. They have a choice, actually poor man has a choice of the eye operation. And the worst is Northeast. Because in Northeast Bihar are a very difficult state to work. First you have to look after yourself, somebody will kidnap you. From there it starts, you know. <laughs> okay, so these are very difficult areas. But uh, every area has its own rule. And no donation should be forever. Except mother's love, nothing should be continuous. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. Okay, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Yes. You had mentioned art and culture. So, um, what kind of help? Do you work with artisans and craftsmen? You know, I mean, do you help, you know, any particular area? There are many, many different varieties there. Huh? For example, there are many great works in India, uh, great art, and they are dying, and there is no documentation of them because you will never come to know after 25 years that such and art existed. For example, Kanta is over some, but some Bengal, many Bengalis are because I have listened to some Bengali conversation. The Kanta uh, this artwork, uh, government of uh, Bangladesh has documented it, but there are no figures in uh, uh, Bangladesh. They cannot have figures. But in West Bengal, we have very beautiful figures, but there is no documentation. So the, this art is maybe more than 1,000 years old, and it's changed over a period of time. So we employed, a, actually this person who worked in somewhere, again. she was a student, maybe in Berkeley, I don't remember. We paid money to a student from Berkeley, or California somewhere, I don't remember. She, we told her to document this art. So we have done metal art of Karnataka, Kasuti of North Karnataka. So some of them we document. Some of them we make DVDs. For example, the touring talkies of uh, Assam was very famous, uh, uh, actually, a touring talkies uh, category. It was not documented. Uh, the Nate or the, the uh, Rangabhumi of uh, Maharashtra, there was no documentation about that. There is an art known as uh, Gamaka in Karnataka. Anyone is from Karnataka will know. It was a dying art. So we revived that art. So we said, okay, we'll buy. Uh, we will we'll record that and distribute it. We must have spent a lot of money, but we revive that art, and that art is again in the form. So is the puppet show of uh, Mangalur. Puppet show of Mangalur. You know, something very extraordinary, very, very good. And it was about to die, it was only one family was there. So we, we helped that family, brought it up, sent them to many places. Even here, I will tell you, if you people are interested, one troop I can send. I can take. I can sponsor the entire group, there are 14 people in that. 
but you have to make the local arrangement and you write to us, still we will be very happy to do because it's one of the rare artists you can see. And smaller artists from a smaller village, we, you know, uh, there are many ways how you trace them. Then we give them an audience in Bangalore and then send abroad, like Kuwait, we have sent Singapore, America, that Akka, they have a program. So we send them abroad. Uh, now I'm sending them to Tehran now because uh, they are very fond of the instrumental music. So we send them abroad. There, is many, there are many scholarships we give them. So we have many, many forms of arts we do. But it's such a treasure in our country. There are thousands of varieties of arts out there. And, but still we will do whatever we can. Yeah. That girl, the young girl is asking. Yeah. You repeat the question, please. Love she hasn't asked yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All that praise, you cut it off. <laughs> okay. Um, I belong to a family where uh, my parents are giving me the full freedom to do whatever I want to do in this in this world. Yeah. Uh, they just have advised me do something in which you will be successful and which you will be the best in the field. Huh. So I have most parents say that. <laughs> <laughs> but if uh, they have no hand in my decision, it has to be completely mine. Um, what is the question? The question is that uh, right now, say for instance, uh, if you look at different industries in the world, uh, if you look at the film industry, uh, to get a good film, to be a, a big actress, you have to you have to be manipulative. You have to get content. That you have to ask Deepika Padukone, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, or if you want to be a researcher uh, in Berkeley or anywhere in the world, you have to be ready to kill 40 to 50 rats a day for the sake of science. In, in both cases, you will lose out on your morals somewhere, right? Uh, but if you're doing what you're doing to earn money to, to give eventually, to give back to society, to give back to your parents, do you think it's all right to, to fall short on your morals a little bit? Uh, what do you think of people in the world who, who commit a lot of sin, who do a lot of crime? And then go to temples and these charity houses and give money. Uh, please, I got your point. You see? <laughs> Number one is giving money to your parents is not philanthropy. <laughs> From there I will start. Well, like I made money and I gave my, my mother a lot of money. I gave it to my sister, my children. No. Philanthropy means those people without a help they will perish. That is philanthropy. Giving to our family members, our own friend circle is not a philanthropy at all. It is, it's, it's a convenient uh, lending money so that we will also when difficulties they will let us back. Don't miss that. Second thing, what is morally right, what is morally wrong is a very difficult philosophical question. For example, when somebody steals, for you that, that is a theft, that means that fellow has made us, he is wrong. For a thief, he is dying of hunger, he is stealing, he said, oh, I am dying of hunger so I want to, I want to eat something. So I don't want to go on a moralistic basis because Everybody's definition of moral is so different. I don't get into that. I only feel in life, whatever you do, do with passion. That much only I can do. Whatever you do, because there are many things we would like to do in life. It may not be possible to do. Because set of circumstances may not allow. Okay? Or situations may not permit. So we get some situation and you should do level best in that with passion. That's all I can tell you. More, more than that, I do not know. Whether I was a teacher, whether I was a philanthropist, whether I am a writer, as a wife, as a mother, I have always done as a daughter. In my field, with my limitations, I have done that work passionately. And that has given me enormous job. That's what I can do. We have time for two more questions. <laughs> yeah, if somebody has one question. Is that one? like a Do you quick, ask one? Yeah, quick question. No, Maybe. I didn't. I you ask one? No. Okay. Is there mm -hmm. like a recommended uh, fraction of money to, not money, <laughs> fraction of the salary to be given as philosophy, as philosophy? It is left to you because how, will I, how do I know what's your financial position? Like a fraction. And not only you as, once you are married, you have to take care of, you know, you have to talk to your wife, you know. That I always believe like, any philanthropy you do, you, there is, in Dharma Shastra only it tells, don't do so much philanthropy that your family will become beggar, you know, beggars and they will ask money from somebody. You should never go out of the, I mean, your, whatever is your limitation. So again, it is left to you how much you want to do. 
there is no rule like that. We have to give 10 percent. How will I decide on 10 percent, 2 percent? It is left to you people. Basically, it is not money. You are again coming to the money. I am not telling money. Actually, I wrote an article. I am not selling my books here, but it is one of my book I have written there. I had a friend actually who just is to listen to your difficulties. No judgment was given. Somebody giving patient hearing itself is a great philosophy. You are in difficulty, you don't want any answer, you know. Someone should listen to you. You have difficulty. And that itself is a philosophy. Listening to someone difficulty. Otherwise, who will listen to that person, you know? So money is some portion, but listening to somebody is difficult. They're giving moral courage. Someone says, I made a mistake today, I don't know. You, you, then you say, it serves you right. So that's not correct. It, do, it does happen. People who walk, they fall. You know, kind words, kind words, listening to others. There's also philosophy. There's no money attached to that. Basically, make other person comfortable, naturally. Either money or in thoughts or in kind words. Right. Last. Burden of the last question. No, that lady. I was I was always a bias to lady, so let uh, It might be a little bit different time, but I wanted yeah. to uh, ask your opinion on global warming and pollution because I feel like, especially in India, big cities are. Yeah, what to do? Then, yes, there is my, a my dad recently developed a lung disease, and many people never, have developed. Yeah, many people in Bangalore have developed, are developing. Yeah. Tell me what to do. India is a country which cannot be stretched. Our land cannot be stretched. Number of people are. What you have to do? Tell me. Practically. Theory, I can talk any theory. <laughs> Practically, your land is limited. Number of people every day they are increasing. Okay? For 1.2, 1.3 billion people. Everybody wants a house. What they have to do? They have to cut the trees. Okay? Now, at least you can say, make it multi story you can say. Consume less, you can say. I believe in consuming less, actually. Because there is no end consuming anymore. Consume less. Okay? Don't put the lights on and sleep. The smaller things, a drop by drop, you can say. You can reduce. But you cannot just take it away, like how my father told me, you can't take away uh, sex workers altogether make it zero, it's just not possible. Reduce it. Similarly, you can consume less. Make your wants less. Actually, the happiest person is the one whose wants are limited. Less. That is that person's happiest. Similarly, make your wants less, consume less. But in India, we cannot afford to have a big bungalow. I always say we are not rich people. Well, let us accept it. Ours is a crowded place. Make a multi story. What is more than that? You cannot say, okay, we can't afford like you people. No, we know our limitation. You have your limitations, or your unlimited land you have. We have limited land. We have too many people, so we should have different categories for it. More than that, it's a reality. What do you can do? That's all I can do. On that note, please join me in thanking the fourth Sarah Kalat